The sudden move of the army rendered this impossible, as the direct route to the capital had been cut off, so the night of the evacuation, the railroad force was ordered to get that camel back to Richmond by the only route left open, namely the very circuitous one by way of Mount Jackson and Staunton. Accordingly, the 199, which had already cost so much time and trouble, was put on the tracks of the Manassas Gap Railroad and taken to Mount Jackson, a distance of 25 miles, and thence by team over the pike, a matter of 70 miles more, to Staunton, where it was again placed on the rails, this time those of the Virginia Central, and hauled to Richmond. The trip occupied about four days, and the movement was the most hurried and exciting of the series. Many bridges had to be strengthened en route, and in crossing some of them, it was found necessary to substitute a block and fall for the horses. Staunton was reached early in the morning, and though it was scarcely daylight, the major portion of the population were up and out to see the novel cavalcade. All the engines were kept at Richmond until the last one had been seized, the original intention having been to do the repairing and refitting there. But in May 1862, when McClellan began his movement up the peninsula and preparations to evacuate the capital were made, the dismantled locomotives and their dislocated members were among the very first freight started out of Richmond. To have allowed those precious camelbacks to fall into the hands of the northern troops after such risks and the expenditure of so much time, ingenuity, and labor would have been galling indeed. Colonel Sharp, who had then been in charge, directed me to hurry the prizes by rail to a safe point in the south. They were accordingly taken to a place on the North Carolina Central Road in Alamance County, North Carolina, about 50 miles west of Raleigh. The movement was successfully accomplished, and the engines found another temporary resting place. Meantime, the large shop buildings of the Raleigh and Gaston Railroad at Raleigh were leased by the southern government, fitted up with improved machinery, and the Confederate States locomotive shops were established. The shops were ready for work by July 1862, and the captured locomotives and the carloads of accessories were hauled back to Raleigh, and a large force of workmen began the refitting and repairing. About ten months were occupied in turning out the locomotives, and it was over 18 months from the date of the first raid on the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad before they were all active in use again. They proved highly valuable in subsequent operations, coming into use as they did when much of the southern rolling stock was completely worn out. The long time covered first in securing and transporting the rolling stock and afterwards in placing it in running order after the dismantling, showed no lack of skill or enterprise on the part of those engaged in the task. But the delay was owing in some degree to the peculiar character of the mechanical obstacles to be overcome. Much more, though, to the frequent changes in the positions of the contending armies. The Railroad Corps had always to follow the Army. The operations were not confined to the carrying off of engines and cars. The best portion of the equipment of the Raleigh shops, including lathes, planers, drill presses, and last but not least a turntable, were all conveyed to Raleigh in cars by way of the Pike and Railroads from the Baltimore and Ohio Roundhouse at Martinsburg. More than this, at a later period of the war, 
the Railroad Corps, who seem to have stopped at nothing, actually tore up and hauled away the ties, rails, spikes, forming about five miles of the Baltimore and Ohio Road between Duffields and Carneysville, and relayed it from Manassas Gap to Centerville for the use of the Army. General Stonewall Jackson wrote from Winchester an update to Major Thomas Rhett on December 2nd, 1861. The enemy are using the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad as far east as the Little Cacapon, and from official information received last night, they commenced working on the Little Cacapon Railroad Bridge at 3 p.m. on Friday last, and will soon complete the work as they had all the building material on hand, they are energetically pressing the railroad repairs eastward, with but comparative little exception. Both tracks have been, by our government, taken up from the Furnace Hill near Harper's Ferry to Martinsburg, and about seven and a half miles of one of the tracks has also been removed west of Martinsburg. One track is as yet preserved for the purpose of hauling away the other to the vicinity of Martinsburg. Captain Sharp, assistant quartermaster, has repaired a locomotive for the purpose of removing the track more rapidly, and today I expect it to commence running, and Captain Sharp expects to be able with it to remove one mile per day of the single track. I have made a detail of 50 men from the militia for the purpose of expediting the work as rapidly as possible. Respectfully, your obedient servant, T.J. Jackson. J.L. Sullivan of the B&O told Union General George McClellan pretty much the same thing, but with more detail in a letter September 7, 1861 have just heard that Confederates have taken up about nine miles of the iron of our track above Martinsburg for repairs of their roads towards Richmond, and have also removed a considerable portion of our telegraph wires for transfer in the same direction. All this is in addition to five locomotives, and some $40,000 worth of valuable machinist tools and materials for railroad repairs, etc., lately taken from our Martinsburg shops, and of which they stated they were greatly in need at the South. The engines were hauled by turnpike through Winchester to Strasburg or some other point on Manassas Road. Mr. Duke remembers and relates with dry humor how, after most strenuous efforts, this piece of track was got into position late Saturday evening and how the very next day, Sunday, it was captured by the Union forces. This episode occurred just prior to Second Bull Run and was a striking example of the extreme uncertainty of war movements. T.K. Cartmel Later, the clerk for Clark County, Virginia, remembered the scenes. This rider witnessed several of these dangerous exploits. The rails were rapidly torn up, cross ties piled in heaps, and great fires made. On these, the rails were thrown, and soon misshapen and useless iron rails were tumbling around. Then... The troopers would jump into their saddles again and move rapidly to another point and await the arrival of the long freights, so rich with the things soldiers needed. And in the rear of this train, and at a safe point, more track would be torn up. And the raiders waited for the big freight to hurry back from the scene the rebels had so lately made for them. On their backward movement... They would run into the break last made, and while the train men were in confusion, the cavalry boys dashed up with yells and pistol firing that demoralized the B&O crew. But the B&O crew was equal to the emergency, and with the aid of the government, soon got their roadbed in shape. 
but too late to deliver reinforcements. It was in constant use, government paying millions for the transfer of shifting armies from east to west and often or however from west to east to recruit the great army of the Potomac. Then Colonel Sharp, who had been promoted from captain and eventually to colonel during the war, was not, many years after the war, made master of transportation of the Baltimore and Ohio Road and filled that important position for a number of years under President John W. Garrett, who was at the head of the road during the war and who was able to appreciate enterprise and ability even when for a season directed against his own interests. Mm-hmm. 